Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Susan Reina Guerrero. I am here today and I'm delighted to have Debbie Resnick with us. Uh, I represent Beacon Therapeutic. We're a non-for-profit social service organization that's been around since 1968. Uh, for the next 30 minutes, you'll be hearing us talk about the Polk Foundation and Debbie's work there as a senior program officer, as well as some of the work that Beacon does. Uh, this is a live call-in show, so uh, please, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to call. The number is 312 738 1060. Uh, before we talk to Debbie and her great work, a little bit of background about Beacon. Uh, we started in 1968. A group of parents were trying to find a specialized educational program for their children. So fast forward to, to 2012, where we are today, we have four different locations, and I'm going to put the information up on the screen. We have four different locations. We have our administrative offices located on 103rd in Beverly. Our homeless services are located 117th and Western, also in Beverly. We have our high school in Calumet Park and our Longwood campus, which is our original program uh, on 107th and Longwood. Beacon really has evolved over the years to offer a myriad of services. We still have our day school services, but we've also expanded to work uh, with the large number of homeless families in the city of Chicago through our homeless outreach services. We also offer early Head Start services to children ages zero to three. We have a CHIPRA program that enrolls children, eligible children, into Illinois' All Kids program. Uh, we have an Innovative Fact program, which is essentially how we got closer with Debbie and the Polk Foundation. We have day treatment programs via our little and intensive big outpatient programs. And we have an outreach initiative under the 100,000 Homes campaign, as well as outpatient mental health services. I'm really happy to have Debbie here today because Thank Debbie you. is a senior program officer at the Polk Brothers Foundation. Uh, and maybe, Debbie, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. It's really great to be here with you. I am a senior program officer at Polk Brothers Foundation. I've been at the foundation for 11 years, and I primarily work in homelessness. Uh, before I came to Polk, I worked in nonprofits in Chicago for 10 years, mostly in the areas of civil rights and social justice. And um, happy to be here. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Uh, now, I know Polk Brothers has a long and rich history. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, Polk Brothers, you know, we all shop the Polk Brothers. So tell me a little bit about the Polk Brothers Foundation and its mission. Sure. It's funny. I'm not from Chicago, and it's always so interesting to hear people remember the stores with such um, fond memories. Oh, yeah. I don't have connections like that to stores from where I grew up. But mm -hmm. the stores were in the community for 55 years, I think. They were started by the Polk family. There were four brothers and a mm -hmm. sister. And it was a chain of furniture and appliance stores. And um, it grew and was very successful over the years. And as the foundation grew, the family was a very caring and charitable family. And as the as the stores grew, sorry, um, they the family invested in the community where where the stores were. And in around 1988, they uh, started the foundation. And in 1992, when the stores closed, they transferred all of the assets over to the foundation, and that's really when Polk um, began as it is now. And although it's a private foundation, a private independent foundation, uh, the family is still involved. There are still three family members on our board, Sandy Polk Guthman, who is mm -hmm. our CEO and board chair, and Howard Polk and Bruce Bachman. So still very connected to the family. Well, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I did grow up with Polk Brothers, the store, and mm -hmm. which was wonderful. But I think I've been so impressed by the capacity of the foundation to really immerse itself in an issue. And I know homelessness has been one of those issues that you've really taken a very strong role. So what's Polk Brothers' interest in homelessness, and how has that evolved? So Polk Brothers Foundation funds in four areas, education, arts, health, and social services. And our social services category is fairly broad, and within it is housing and homelessness, community development, workforce development, mental health services, youth programs. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation's assets are about uh, $400 million, and we give away um, in grants about 22 or $23 million a year within the borders mm -hmm. of the city of Chicago. And so homelessness was always a part of our board's interest. The, the mission of the foundation is to um, support Chicago families and mm -hmm. to um, 
to to uh, provide equality for everybody who lives in the city. And the uh, foundation really goes by um, the strategy is really to be responsive to community needs and to do what the community tells us they need and to make mm -hmm. sure that the organizations have the resources that they need. And so homelessness, as you know, is a is a very challenging and important issue in the city. And so from the beginning, it was something that our board cared very much about. Yeah, it sounds like, and I, and I get the relationship now, and I, and I think um, what's so important is what you said, what, what are the, to some degree, what are the priorities within the community? Mm -hmm. And clearly everybody's talking so much about homelessness, mm -hmm. and we know there's a lot of work that's being done on developing this new plant and mm -hmm. homelessness, and we're also identifying increasing new populations mm -hmm. that we know they're on the rise. So it's always been individuals, families has gotten greater um, interest over the years, mm -hmm. and of course now everybody's talking about youth, which mm -hmm. is so invaluable. Mm -hmm. But I think what's different with Polk and with yourself is that you really have gone above and beyond what I think uh, you know, when, you, when you think of a senior program officer. What does a senior program officer do? And again, I, I see that and I'd like to hear that, but it's also I think you've gone beyond that. So what does a senior program officer do? Thank you. Oh. Well, a senior program officer is, um, we have different areas that we're responsible for at the foundation. And um, we review requests for support, and we go out and visit the organizations, and we look at their finances, and then we make recommendations to our board about funding. Um, we help define with our board what the funding strategies should be within a particular area, and so we look at the things that we think are most effective in terms of strategies for resolving the issues, and on our website we have um, what we call program area guides for each area that we fund, and again it lists the strategies that we think are the most effective based on best practices, and then has some information about um, how we evaluate those programs or how we hope organizations are evaluating the programs. Um, and then at Polk Brothers Foundation, we also have the opportunity, as you said, to participate in the community. And each of us really tries to get as involved in po as possible in the areas in which we fund, first of all, because it makes us more knowledgeable mm -hmm. and um, better funders. And then it's another way to leverage the, the foundation's impact. Well, and I perfect segues we're going to switch maybe now to some of the this more uh, on the ground work that you're doing I would like to remind everyone that this is a live call-in show so if you have any questions or comments please feel free to call the number is 312-738-1060 my name is Susan Reyna I am the president and CEO of Beacon Therapeutic and we're here today with Debbie Resnick senior program officer at Polk Brothers Foundation um, so Debbie we're talking about uh, you know getting involved in the community and so on and I know you're heavily involved in the community both locally as well as nationally. What does some of that involvement look like on a local level? So uh, about 10 years ago, shortly after I joined the foundation, was when the city was really creating its first plant on homelessness and was being very inclusive in terms of wanting broad community participation. And some of the local foundations were invited to participate. And I was um, a member on that first uh uh, planning council. Mm -hmm. It's been under different names over the years, as were you. And I should take a moment to say that I think, you know, Beacon has played an incredible leadership role in the city in terms of its plan and in terms of shaping um, the way the city addresses homelessness. And if you talk about families rising as a priority, I think Beacon has played a real role in making sure that that happens. And we're at Thank a you. really exciting, we're at a really exciting point um, about about what we're gonna do with families. And I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk about some of the things that, mm -hmm. that you've done. Um, but so there are, so there's a group that um, is responsible for um, helping decide how Chicago's funds from um, the Federal Office of Housing and Urban Development are spent. The city gets about $55 million a year. And it's a strong partnership with the city and with other service providers. And we spend a lot of time talking about what our priorities should be and what's the best use of our limited resources and how to work together to 
help mitigate this issue. And I think, you know, what you're describing clearly is, is bringing key systems together. Mm -hmm. So we have the private foundation community, which is the group that you represent. And then we have city folks there. So that's mm -hmm. the city dollars that are brought to bear. And then providers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then consumers. Mm -hmm. That's the other very strong Con thank voice you. Yes. within that arena. Yeah. And I think um, that's where you get the systems integration. You get the collaborations, which is so invaluable when we talk about resources are so limited. So you mentioned $55 million. You know, if anybody's watching this, thinking like, oh, my God, like that's so money. much money. You know, but then when you look at really what what the needs are, you know, we talk about homeless individuals, homeless families, homeless youth, uh, and then all those subgroups. You have domestic violence issues, uh, you know, individuals living with HIV AIDS, veterans. I mean, it's it's just it's such a huge population, and everybody has to draw from that. Definitely, and that money, you know, that HUD money covers uh, rental subsidies, which is a huge part of where the where the costs are. But it also covers some case management and all of the services that are so important to wrap around people. Um, so, and I think that's what what's so neat about that level of uh, that level of collaboration. Now, I know you do things at a national level also, so. You know, what, well, and actually the, the piece here, which I think is invaluable, is when you look at, you know, you are one of the representatives from the from the foundation community, but there's other key foundations, too, that, that are interested. I know McCormick has been very active, you know, and there's Pierce and the Chicago Community Trust. I mean, there's different folks that are really, but, you know, you as funders have gotten together. Prince Charitable, Prince Trust, Charitable Trust and uh, the Michael Race Health Trust. So there's other there's a group of key foundations that are really interested in this topic and they're and they're putting not only their money there but they're also their energies and their think you know you, you guys are very bright folks so everybody's kind of putting forth their ideas. What kind of things are happening at a national level that you're involved in? Sure and I think I just to the to the um, collaborative aspect I think Chicago has um, a fairly unique collaboration and um, I think we have a reputation for the way that we have been inclusive and collaborating together and it is very important that the city um, is at the table the way that they are and that we have an opportunity to um, work over the years we've worked to align federal funding with city funding which I think has been really helpful for providers so at a national level, I'm on the board of an organization called Funders Together to End Homelessness. And um, it's a group of foundations and corporations who are investing in strategic and catalytic ways, um, catalytic funding. And what I mean by catalytic yeah, funding, cool. yeah. what I mean by that is, you know, our grants are a small part, um, but, but we hope they enable something bigger to occur mm -hmm. out of it. And so, what I've been able to do is, I think, two ways. Um, one is take some of the learnings that we have here and share them with others. But more importantly for Chicago is, um, you know, our Polk Brothers Foundation is, is, uh, is a foundation that funds only in the city. And so um, the opportunity to have a voice at a national level about some of the policies that are so important and impacting yeah. our work is limited. And the size of my voice and, and other funders' voices um, at some of the foundations in the city are also somewhat limited. As a member of the board of Funders Together to End Homelessness, I have the opportunity to participate in direct conversations with mm -hmm. people in the federal government who are mm -hmm. making the policies that have such enormous impact on uh, how we can spend our money, what we can spend our money on, how much money that we get. Um, and so that's been really important. And um, there's a couple of ways I think distinctly that are important that have been and that are important now. So have been is that um, over time we've really been moving toward a more client-centered, uh, lower demand kind of services. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means, as, as you all know, because I think that um, many of the all the programs that I know about from Beacon and, um, and that's mostly the work that you do with families, are, is very client-centered and it means that instead of saying um, to a family, you know, sort of here are the things that you need to do in order to get and keep housing, it's really focused on asking the family what their goals are and how, mm -hmm. how they'd like to meet their goals and what are the things that are causing barriers to those goals and and if they are, in fact, uh, risky behaviors, how do you reduce that mm. risk over time? Harm reduction. Um, harm reduction. It's <laughs> okay. called harm reduction. And so um, I think 
we've had a, a back and forth um, nationally mm -hmm. with that in terms of um, helping. Um, I mean, I think HUD is definitely moving in that direction, not just because of Chicago. I mean, I think harm reduction is is um, become known nationally as a very a important practice. and mm -hmm. best practice. Um, so that's impacted the both ways. It's impacted the work mm -hmm. here as well. Right now, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is healthcare reform, and healthcare reform is going to have a huge impact on social service agencies in the city, as you know, and agencies in the area that we work in terms of homelessness. So many more of our clients or the people that we are working with are going to be eligible for mm -hmm. Medicare. Mm -hmm. And Medicaid, and um, it's also going to enable housing and services to be seen as part of health care. And so um, working with our state now um, to, to figure out how we can best leverage our resources and deal with um, the opportunities that that provides is really exciting. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, you're describing this landscape that keeps on shifting. <laughs> And I think, you know, uh, you know, some of the things you were talking about, you know, these best practices, harm reduction, low barrier, uh, you know, flexible, you know, motivational. I mean, it's, it's all these things that people are talking about. And then now introducing this whole new arena of what's going to mean with all these health care changes. Mm -hmm. So how do you as a private foundation or you as a, as a program officer, one, keep abreast of all these things? But how do you make decisions <laughs> in terms of how are you going to, these scarce resources, how are you going to allocate these resources? So... You know, I one of the ways I keep abreast of it is by talking to experts like you. Um, okay. I mean, I have the privilege of working with people who, you know, do this on a day to day basis, dedicate their lives to this work, and I always learn an, an enormous amount from talking to the people in the city who are doing the direct work. Um, I try to, you know, follow as much of the national news and information that's coming out about specifically about these areas as I can. Um, a lot of it's complicated for me, and I think that I understand sometimes, you know, a portion of it. Um, and it's it's um, and I again, I think I really rely on the expertise here um, to help to help guide that. Um, in terms of the limited resources, you know, I think it's challenging, and I think um, it's challenging for all of us. And uh, we are in the bu in the midst of a serious mm. state budget crisis, and so um, everything that all all of the work that you're doing and all of the work that the agencies are doing in the city, there's more demand for it, and there's not opportunity or not a lot of opportunity to significantly increase those resources. So. What we need to do is how to fi figure out how to be more effective with the resources that we currently have at hand. And so when we think about limited resources, we think about um, providing grants in ways that help um, agencies be able to do more with the uh with with the resources that they currently have and I think I if we can talk about fact a little bit I mean I think mm -hmm. that would be a way to provide a great example of of how um, resources have been leveraged and why we invested in that program yeah and that's that was gonna bring that up because I think you know, you're talking about this it's it's building collaborations and partnerships mm -hmm. and I think fact is truly an example of that so uh, to explain a little bit about what FACT is, it was an innovative project that was funded initially with, through funding through the Conrad Hilton Foundation and key funders here in Chicago. So it was Polk, it was McCormick, it was Prince, and it was the uh, the city of Chicago. Right. And essentially, those key folks brought together their resources and uh, put out a proposal that, that indicated that their mother needed to have outcomes, child needed to have outcomes, the family, and then the system. And it specifically targeted young mothers ages 18 to 25 who had one child under the age of five. So the work itself and what Beacon did is that we were able to uh, identify key partners that we brought to the table. So Beacon took the lead. We were able to uh, garner the, the partnership of Heartland Alliance. They were our senior partner. And then we had other partners along the way, Inner Voice, Voices for Illinois Children, Goldie's Place, Thresholds. And essentially through this collaboration, we were able to bring the best of each of those organizations and really for the betterment of, of the population that we we're working with. Uh, the other, the Probably the most unique piece was the systems work, and then that's where you really came in, you and some of the other funders uh, sitting around the tables, this planning coalition. What was your role in the planning coalition? Can you give me some insight in terms
terms of how you fit in with that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one of the primary goals of FACT was to bring together the homeless service system right, with the early child development system because both of those groups or, you know, groups of agencies were working with similar or sometimes the same population, but there really wasn't a lot of in interaction between the two of them. Um, and so we did receive a number of applications, and the reason that we chose FACT and the project for which Beacon was the lead agency was because, um, in part, because of the systems integration component, because the idea was to figure out ways to bring those systems together um, in a way that would serve the clients for this particular pilot project and program, but also that would have impact on all of the people who are served mm -hmm. by these systems in the city and have lasting impact on it. So uh, one piece was the systems integration piece, which was a um, the creation of a coalition of a wide range of providers, again, homeless service providers, early childhood development experts, uh, DCFS, CPS, uh, funders, uh, government representatives, and um, worked together to figure out, again, how to do more with the resources that they had. And one of my favorite examples from it is mm -hmm. that um, there were um, youth who were leaving DCFS um, and, mm -hmm. and when, when it was time for them to exit foster care, and um, they didn't always have all of the information that they needed and the paperwork that they needed to be able to access resources and subsidies. And so FACT came up with the idea of creating sort of a checklist of papers that everybody should leave with. And it was simple. It didn't cost any money, but it's made an enormous difference in terms of um, the speed mm. at which people can access services. Um, I know that there's been um, lots of impact on young kids who are in the shelter system getting services, early childhood development services mm -hmm. that they didn't have necessarily a uh, access to before. Um, so I just participated as one of those members going to those meetings and listening to what the issues were and helping be a part of the conversations to think through uh, how to make some of those changes. Um, but I would say that I do think the other piece of the, the project was equally as important, and that was um, I think creating uh, fact is family assertive community treatment, which you may have said already. Mm -hmm. and, and ACT teams were, were for adults, and they were teams of specialists who would sort of wrap services around an adult to make sure that they had everything that they needed, the mental health services, the physical health services, housing, job. Um, and, and so FACT modified that and tried it with families to provide those services both for young moms and but also and their children and to really make sure that the children got integrated into a community so that when when their time with the program was over they were connected to resources mm -hmm. on a permanent basis and FACT and Beacon and Heartland have received national attention for this work and for the incredible outcomes that they've had with these families who are just really thriving under this kind of service. And so I think, you know, I think both of those pieces are really exciting. And I think, you know, when you, we talk about, you know, effectiveness and use of resources and impact, you know, we're talking about leveraging other resources that really help these families. So we talked about the Chicago Public School System or DCFS system. So I think, you know, together everybody has been able to make an impact. And I think it's been really helpful to hear how the foundation community, you know, as an example, Polk Brothers, really has made an impact, you know. So we have apparently a minute left or something like that. I was wondering if you had any final thoughts or comments uh, for those that are watching. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to just take that last minute to just say again that I think that Beacon has played an enormous role. I think Beacon's direct services and individual services as an agency um, are highly effective and valuable. But I also think that the role that you've played in guiding the city is invaluable. And there's some things that we didn't have a chance to talk about today, but that Beacon is leading the nation in helping to develop uh, a way to judge the vulnerability of families and help prioritize which families are are most at need for services. And so um, I just want people to understand the broad impact that you're having and how lucky we are to have you in the community.
today. Well, thank you. That's very nice. See, it went by very quickly. We could have more time to talk. Uh, well, thank you very much, Debbie. It's been a pleasure having you today. I'm delighted that you were able to spend the past uh, 30 minutes with us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we will be here again next week. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye. Um,